now it's time to introduce Zoe and Hannah. So Zoe, do you want to go first and introduce yourself and talk a little bit about why we're here today? Yep. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, evening, everybody. Um, my name is Zoe Partington. I sit on the um, Cultural Compact for Shropshire. Um, and I suppose uh, one of the reasons that I'm um, here today is to talk about the work that I do around accessibility to art, culture, heritage um, and architecture. Um, but specifically, it's going to be about about culture across Shropshire. Um, and a lot of the work, I, and I've been doing this for about 30 years, um, so some of the work is around um, teaching people about frameworks they can use to make sure they're meeting um, access needs for disabled audiences, neurodiverse audiences and deaf audiences. It's quite a wide cross section of people. Um, and of course, you know, intersectionality is also part of that. So it's making sure that we're welcoming to everyone. Um, some of my work is around programming. Uh, some of my work is around working as a disabled artist myself and being quite definite about that. Um, so some of the images being shown are artworks that I've created, but they're all to do with disability arts and culture, disability heritage, which is really useful. If you can go away afterwards and find out about this, it's really useful to know. Um, so one of the images says nothing about us without us that can apply to everyone and to disabled people as well. The one at the bottom is a neon sign in shocking pink called Disability Pride. This has really come from the 90s around disabled people, disabled artists going onto main stages and really becoming um, part of the everyday. We're still a little way from that, but it's still, it's there and it's a, you know, it's a desire that we're trying to push. Um, and then the other image is really four disabled people with black masks on. And um, and really, it's just the there's a, a board being held up and it says, shush, we are not really disabled. This is really to do with political things around disabled people still having to justify their impairment, justify their disability. And it particularly this particular image was created around the way that the government changed disability living allowance to personal independent payments. And that was because disabled people were again being judged and being asked to prove that they were disabled people so it's something that we need to always be aware of but i think the more welcoming we are and the more that we open up to customers across the board um the less of these discussions we'll be having really so i pass to hannah thank you zoe <clears throat> So I'm Hannah Pryor. Um, like lots of people that work in the arts, I have many hats that I wear. Um, so I'm artistic director and programmer for Arts Live and Flicks and Sticks. So bringing um, live theatre and music to rural spaces, um, looking at opportunities to uh, work with audiences that are perhaps harder to reach, um, that haven't connected perhaps into live work previously. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Ignition which is a community interest company um, which I founded with my co-founder Kate um, about 11 years ago now and our focus is around opportunities in arts and culture for children and young people with disabilities so it's about the grassroots about running projects about opportunities for young people to take part in creativity uh, particularly theatre um, I'm a theatre maker that's that's my background um, but also influencing people that make those decisions as well so running training opportunities um, with uh, culture, leisure and tourism, so with some of the venues in Shropshire, um, but also being able to influence and show people what they might do, those people that perhaps have the purse strings or are the decision makers, so that actually we can run really strong projects at the ground, but actually, you know, being able to influence those that are making decisions at the top. Um, like Zoe, I am also a, a maker myself. My practice is theatre. Um, so again, making work that reflects and represents stories um, that are perhaps not told elsewhere and also utilising different tools and techniques. Um, that might be um, more accessible to people. Um, also, like Zoe, a board member for uh, Vibrant Shropshire, but also for the National Rural Touring Forum, which is the, the network of rural touring schemes across the, uh, the UK. 
Um, so just to describe myself, I am a white woman with uh, long brown hair um, in my 40s um, and today I'm wearing a green jumper and behind me I've got my, my background blurred but um, I've got some painting that I did myself where I lost the patience with fully painting the walls so I did some random splodges in my office um, which is what you can uh, what is behind me um, so that's obviously in terms of my um, my my work but in terms of my lived experience I have lived experience of disability both um, directly through myself and through close family members um, very much the work that I do is about looking at practical opportunities I think it's really really important important that people have tangible things that they can do to enable enable better access um, for people and that whilst pieces of legislation like the Equalities Act are good and it's important to be able to have those actually be able to understand what you can do in your organisation in your venue in terms of being practical and applying that is really kind of at the, the the kind of main part of my work and what I look to achieve. Paul, do you think you could just flash up? I think it's the next slide just for a second. So <clears throat> this is an image that I just wanted to show you, which I think gives a bit of a um, hopefully a resonance and a context to how I like to work. And uh, it's an image of a curtain, a red velvet curtain that was part of a pantomime that we put on in a forest. And this was for children, young people who perhaps wouldn't have been able to go and experience live theatre in an indoor venue. Um, some of them had sensory processing needs, some of them um, perhaps being in that physical contained space of a more traditional um, setting uh, might have made it difficult for them to be able to take part. So thinking about what the barriers are, thinking about removing those barriers, we utilised the outdoor space where there was opportunities to walk away if you wanted to, where it was perhaps less sensory stimulating. And I, I like to use this as an example because whilst I see this as a very specific project, it does give that idea of, you know, there's always ways to do things. If we can use the creativity that we have, the lateral thinking ability that we have in arts and culture to be able to think about ways to do things differently. And that answer might not always be to you know put a show on outside but what else is it what else could it be and I, I really like this as a visual image of that to kind of prompt people into thinking how else can we do things um, what are the other options um, what do people need from us so yes that's me I'll hand back to Alice I just realized, I realized I'm muted <laughs> thank you very much Hannah that's great um, so 3rd of December is International Day of People with Disabilities and it's also Disability History Month this month as well. Why do you think it's significant, both of you, Zoe and Hannah? Why do you think it's important to sort of recognise and complement these days? I think, um, I mean, obviously the International Day of Disabled People, which they've changed the name they always do. <laughs> um, <laughs> over the years, um, <laughs> was really significant when it first started because disabled people were still really brought into events by the Lord Mayor being present and being shipped in, in wheelchairs and not really part of the discussion or the artwork or the the talk for the day. Um, and over the years, it's really, really changed. So the International Day of Disabled People, so really, you know, uh, you know, 20 years ago, it was a big celebration where disabled people would come together, share their art, share their um, share their fun parts of their lives, not just all the negativity and neg negativity and not just the barriers. So it was about embracing each other, being together and celebrating, I suppose, in a way, difference and diversity um, in a fun way, because a lot of the time disabled people are, you know, seen as being very oppressed and accessing barriers and people see you in a pitiful sense. So it was a real, to trying to shift that really, make it more human and add a different sort of value and sense to it. And I, I think the other reason Disability History Month is really important is that, you know, there is a history for, uh, there's, you know, there's a whole heritage and a whole history to disabled people within different impairment groups. And the more you find out about disability culture and disability history, the more you can make informed decisions about how you improve your own services, your own your own venues, your own programming. Um, I think all of that gives you really solid insight into how to shape the future, 
how things have changed really over the last 30 years and they've changed an awful lot and I think we should celebrate that that's absolutely fantastic you know some of my role is to go around the world with British Council to share these values that we have around equality provision across art and culture um, and even in transporting and other things but we're sort of talking about culture today um, to say what we've improved and how we've developed it and and people really embrace that in other places where they've not had the opportunity to have that discussion. And the other thing to say, which is really quite unique about the UK, is that disabled academics and disabled artists were drawn together to start working together to really change the infrastructure and the nature of um, the nature of. Of, of the visibility of disabled people really in everyday lives and that has also had a huge um a huge it's had a huge change and it has made people more um you know more every day which is which is how it should be but I know we're still quite a long way from some of that Hannah do you want to carry on <laughs> yeah absolutely um I think it's really good as you said to kind of reflect on the journey and what that might mean I think it's also really important that this day is used as a culmination and amplification of um, the things that have happened during the year rather than perhaps being a, a tick box for a day just for organizations to say they've been involved for one day and you know that's them that's them done as it were um I think as, as Zoe said it's really good to be able to take time to reflect on on st positive stories and highlight good representation um, and good practice as well and as we're doing today come together and be able to share that and I think really the rest of the year should be about thinking about the actions that we do to lead towards these moments so that there is kind of um, a purpose to it and we're working towards things. I think as well that, that you know often we talk about change and, and radical change but I think actually change can start with really small steps and I think that everybody um, can think about things that they can do within their organisation or venue that is practical and measurable that can actually have an impact and those things can be they can be small they can be big they can be short term they can be long term they can be cheap they can cost money but if we're all thinking about small actions that we can deliver the power of the collective I think we shouldn't underestimate that and I think you know this is a really good opportunity to bring people together to start to continue that collective because I know some of this work is already happening in the county but to be able to connect together good practice and I think learning from each other is is always a really good place to start and kind of having marked places in the calendar is, is really good for that to be able to bring people together share best practice learn from each other um, I think also it's good to remember that access isn't just about you know filling in um, what the funders have asked us or what our governing bodies have asked us that it is about changing opportunities and you know being able to make uh, opportunities for disabled people and underrepresented people within arts and culture so that it's not just that policy that sits you know in a dusty folder or a box that you've got to tick because Arts Council have asked you to fill it in I think you know having these opportunities to come together can hopefully make meaningful opportunities for collectivity and also like I said for sharing uh, best practice because I'm sure all of us are in different places in our journey of access, um, but actually, you know, learning from things that other people have done, and even if it's something you're doing really well, learning to amplify that and share that, I think these opportunities and marked places in the calendar are really good for that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. A few people have just arrived while we were talking there, so I'm just going to remind people that we are recording this meeting, and if they don't want to be filmed please turn your cameras off you can do that at the top just click camera um, and if you want to ask any questions while we're talking um, just use the chat function as well if you want captions as well I'll mention this again just for anyone that was has just joined us you can click more the three dots at the top click on language and speech and click on turn on live captions so and then that'll generate automatic captions at the bottom for you okay great so what radical change do you mo most want to see in arts and culture and maybe the wider world around barriers, overcoming barriers to participation? Zoe? Um, yeah, just say that again then, Alice, sorry. What radical change do you most want to see in arts and culture and maybe the wider world? I think what 
I think what I'd like to see is um, is more, uh, I suppose, disabled artists represented, you know, in the theatre. So, you know, deaf actors on stage a lot more, uh, you know, blind people at the centre of things. Um, really, it's about because I think it's it's really important in the late 90s I used to put events on this was in Birmingham at the med bar at the custard factory disabled people would come and do uh, we used to have a um, an evening where disabled artists would perform in that med bar and disabled people from the city used to come in and say they'd never ever seen a disabled person on stage and they were so excited it was such a change and such a difference to actually see a disabled person in that position that it made them, you know, sort of, I suppose, just happy and pleased that they felt they had a place in society and they could be valued. So for me, it's about, it's that visibility, I think, of disabled people in art and culture, much more than we, we currently see that. Hannah, what about you? What sort of change do you want to see in arts and culture? Absolutely, um, echo everything that Zoe said about representation, I think that's really important. Um, and also being able to um, pull people in and have a, a an equal uh, representation of the number of people in society versus those that are working in the arts, because that is really disparate still at the moment in terms of, one, the number of uh, disabled people that are working and two, the number of people that are working in the arts because of a variety of barriers. So I think absolutely that. I think as well, it's kind of, you know, there's a, sometimes there's a lot of talk around um, inclusion and access, particularly from kind of higher bodies that be, shall we say. And actually, it's really important that those bodies then actually fulfil that in how they operate and, you know, things like... Um, grant forms, things like how we are asked to do monitoring, how we're asked to complete um, funding applications, you know, that there is sometimes talk of how we want to be more equitable and inclusive, but then actually the systems around what happens doesn't necessarily follow that. And I think, you know, we have kind of a a duty to think about you know if we are asking for these things what is it that we can then do to support that so that it doesn't just become something that we're saying but something you know like I said is there a an alternate version um so for example with Arts Alive we've currently been recruiting and rather than just saying it's a CV and a covering letter you're still very welcome to do that if you'd like to if that's your preference we have said that people can answer the questions via a voice note or um, a visual powerpoint presentation um, or a video or a combination of so being able to have things in the mechanisms and kind of radically changing some of the systems of how things work that actually do what they're being asked to do rather than just saying that they want better equity and inclusion but then not fixing things in the system that are are wrong or don't work or are not accessible yeah okay I think and I think that's a really important point actually I think people sometimes forget that to those sort of accessibility requirements and things they forget about the sort of accessible documents and I think that's something we can all learn from and do better with I think definitely yeah, but it's a, think, it's, defi- it's a learning curve, isn't it? Definitely is. Yeah. And I think the thing, Hannah, is, um, and, and to Alice, is what we want people to do is if you're if you're asking for feedback, um, you know, action the feedback in a way. So it's it's one of those things that you could only, you know, even if you don't like what the feedback is, I think it's really important to to know what the barriers are, because you don't always know what the barriers are. Yeah. And I think, you know, if you ask for feedback, then try somehow to action some of it. And some things might be, and this is why we were talking a little bit earlier, it's not always about huge budgets. It might just be providing cushions for chairs or making sure you've got chairs with armrests so people can get up and out of the chair easily. Um, so it can be really little tiny things which can be quite manageable. Um, it doesn't have to be these enormous things. It might be that if you're running a poetry evening on the top, you know, on the, the, the first floor of a pub, that you actually think about next time programming it on a, you know, somewhere where there's level access or also maybe streaming it, live streaming it, because 
it's not just about disabled people. It might be that parents with children can't get to that poetry evening. So I think this is where we start to open it up to huge amounts of different audiences in different ways. So I think it's just it's that little subtle shift between having to do these giant things, but these little things can all add up and make a huge difference. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, this isn't just about disability access, this talk. It's about other overcoming other barriers to participation, being a rural <laughs> county, financial barriers, things like that, isn't it, as well? Yes, yeah. And I, I mean, we know, don't we, yes, for, from transport, from rural issues. But I think yeah. what we do know, and I'll probably both me and Hannah know this from experience, very often, if you make it accessible to disabled people, you make it accessible to everyone. So I think it's yeah. really important to try and remember that. And, you know, things like the social model of disability give you a framework which actually can be applied to everyone, not just disabled people. Yeah. So yeah, we've actually got uh, perhaps we could reference for those people that perhaps might not have heard of the social model of disability. Um, Paul, if you don't mind going to slide four, there's an image on there. Um, this this may be something that people are aware of, but may not be. So um, are you able to flash that slide up, Paul? I think it's number four. I'm on second. Sorry, Paul, putting you under the... Uh... No, that's fine. Shall I give a bit of history while we do it? <laughs> yeah, that would be good. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, quite quite some years ago, probably 40, 45 years ago, uh, Vic Finkelstein, Mike Oliver, and I think maybe Jenny Harris, but other disabled people were involved in thinking about um, why people were segregated. So why did disabled people go off to other schools and not, you know, the local comprehensive or, you know, the mainstream school where you were? Um, so they began to ask sort of questions about how we had decided to to split disabled people from from everybody else. Um, and that consistence, that consistent thing of othering disabled people so that they weren't, you know, um, part, part of the circles that people were in their communities. So the social model of disability was developed, particularly because Vic Finkelstein had been based in South Africa um, prior to coming to the UK. So he'd seen lots of segregation of, um, you know, sort of uh, different types of diversity and different people culturally. Um, so the social model was developed to try and think about where do we place um, the barriers. So one of the things with the social model, it's not about the disabled person. So that is the sort of the medical model. The medical model looks at the and you can you know, you can coin it in a sense by saying it's the what's wrong with you model. But the social model of disability starts to look at the things in a different way. So it's not it's not what's wrong with you. It's not that you can't climb the steps onto the bus or into that building or you can't communicate because you're a deaf person. The social model starts to look at where the barriers really are. So the social model of disability would say, you know, stepped access into a building or anywhere um, needs to be adjusted because that's the barrier it's not the disabled person or the older person that's the barrier so if we create level access or we have lifts or we find a way of of changing that access we make it accessible to everyone so it's really important to see that the under the social model the barriers are external to the disabled person so there are things that we put in the way to make a disabled person's life um, difficult really or or not as equal to other things so all the time if you use the social model of disability to look at the frameworks that are in place, you can begin to unpick rather than keep going round and round in circles about there's not, you know, that um, transport's inaccessible or communications inaccessible. We can start to look at what are the solutions to change those barriers so we can move forward. Now, one of the things is obviously deaf people, not all deaf people, but some deaf people use British Sign Language to communicate. One of the things that we know that's still lacking in the UK is that the government does not have British Sign Language on the curriculum in schools. If it did, we'd remove the need to have sign interpreters. We'd all be using sign language and we'd all be getting on and chatting and deaf people wouldn't be excluded as much as they are. So I think all these things are really important. If we can push and change for these things to happen, then we'll begin to naturally and in a very human way, start to involve a lot more people. Do you want to add to that, Hannah? I know there's lots of examples. Yeah, well, I was just going to, if Paul doesn't mind flashing up the next slide, um, number five. So kind of just, I think you gave, you gave a really 
great example, Zoe, so I won't kind of go into any more detail specifically about um, social model of disability or the medical model. And again, you know, these are all kind of starters of conversations, I guess, this evening. It would be great if there's things that you can go away and research or, you know, ask more questions about in the chat if you'd like to. So one of the things in terms of the, the practical implementation of the social model of disability that I often get organisations and venues that I'm working with to look at is to think about the four particular types of barriers that might be within that social model. So that could be, and I'm aware this is, is very small, so I, I will read some of these. So the top one is ad attitudinal barriers. So these attitudinal barriers can be things that are kind of overtly prejudiced. You know, unfortunately, we still do have hate crime in this country, but also can be kind of the unconscious or subconscious attitudes that people may have about disability and that kind of links in a little bit to what Zoe was talking about at the ring um, and I'm sure Zoe and I have many examples of uh, things that have happened to us so that reflects that attitudinal barrier. Um, one of the things that I think is kind of a, a good representation of it is something that happened to me when I was going to a venue. I pulled up into the accessible parking space. The uh, venue person, venue manager came out and said, oh, sorry, you do realise that uh, that's a, a disabled parking space, don't you? Um, and so I said, yes, I do. Um, and I got out, I unloaded my wheelchair and not that I would have had to have unloaded my wheelchair to need to use that disabled space. And then he, he said, he was like, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Because when I was driving my car, what he saw in the driving window, whatever this is to him, isn't a person with a disability. And I think that is the kind of unconscious, subconscious barriers that sometimes happen is that people have a perception about what disability is. Um, I think particularly the fact that we often use the wheelchair symbol as um, a symbol for disability can actually be quite tricky um, because it then means that that is kind of you know what people sometimes think disability the only disability that there is um, I think we're getting better with that you probably noticed in um, some shops and restaurants that the signs up that say not all disabilities are visible and I think that's really important to remember you know that we can't always see what people's disabilities are um, also in terms of kind of wheelchair users I think it's something like only eight percent of disabled people are wheelchair users and then a third of those are actually ambulant so can walk so um, I'm a wheelchair user I also walk sometimes I use a stick sometimes I don't um, and I've, I've seen it in people's faces when I stand up from my wheelchair you know I'm kind of like it's a miracle because pe people's perception of what disability is can really impact the decisions that they make and I think it's really important in your organisation or at your venue or in your company to question some of those you know and have conversations amongst yourselves because sometimes we don't even realise like we all have our own lived lens and experience and sometimes we don't even realise that we hold those thoughts or that our experience means that we think these things but they're not actually true um, so I think attitudinal barriers are really important to look at. Environmental barriers which often is the thing that people think about when we say access they think about ramps into buildings uh perhaps things like um audio loops um captions subtitles um as as uh, we talked about bsl in spaces um so they're obviously an important element organizational barriers as well and i think these are really interesting because they're often very dug into organizations and they can be things like if you are um, having a show, perhaps it's only at 7 or 7.30 and that's the only time that you actually have people come to your space and it's the only offer that you have. And if you ask people, they may say, well, you know, that's that's how we do it. That's how we've always done it. And I think it's really important to question those organisational barriers. You know, could you, if it was a show or, a you know, a participatory activity, if you're only running it at certain times because that's what you've always done, you're potentially excluding populations that you know might want to connect with you if you are more flexible in those and then the last one is those informational barriers and that's kind of multifold so that can be about your marketing about how you talk about what you do it can be the language you use you know does it reflect for the people you're kind of trying to connect to do you have representation in the images you're using that show that this is a place for for all people you know and that there's a mix of people that are being represented in the images you use on your website or your flyers or your posters 
But it can also be that actually you're doing the stuff already. And sometimes this is what I find when I um, work with organisations is that they're already doing it, but they're not necessarily amplifying it or sharing it to the people that would benefit from it. And what I like about this as kind of a model is that it takes four very tangible, practical things and you can almost run anything through this. So if you're running um, a workshop, if you've got a show on, if you've got an exhibition, if you are you know, doing a piece of consultation, you can run almost every element through this and see, you know, are the things we're missing? Are the things we could be amplifying? Um, are the questions that we need to ask because we don't have the answers yet? And it gives, as I said at the beginning, a really practical way to come up with solutions um, and to start conversations as well. Um, I found it really beneficial when I've used this with organisations and venues and being able to get to kind of what might be some of the barriers to people coming into their space. Yeah, that's, a, and I think that's a really good point. And that's, that's really nicely led me on to my point that I was next going to make about the responsibility and where that lies and into how to improve those or how to overcome those barriers to participation. Um, it's the responsibility of all of us as, as arts organisations funders, but not the people who are disadvantaged. So it's so it's really to, down to those organisations, the drivers for funders to get involved. You know, does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it might be worth adding to that as well, Alice, because I, I it was quite a while ago, but I was chatting on um, Radio Shropshire about the work that I do. And I, I run something called Disordinary Architecture alongside a woman called Joss Boyce, um, which is really about disabled artists going into design and architecture, but also about the designing of spaces and environments and solutions to that. Um, and one of the things is to think about. Um, Oh, I've lost my train of thought there. Sorry. <laughs> what were you just saying, Alice? I'm just completely gone. About um, how organize it's the responsibility of organisations to sort of look at how they can overcome these barriers to participation, and then about how what how we can drive funders to overcome them. Yes, yes. So, um, so it's always about making sure that you start. Sorry, that's hard dog. No, um, analyzing really the sort of frameworks that you've got in place to um to look at the barriers so one of the things that people might think about is that they'll have a male and a female um toilet facility and then they'll say there's not enough room to have um an accessible toilet um but one of the things is lots of venues now just have an accessible toilet they don't necessarily have both and also this is really important when you think about the transgender community that about opening up the offer to everyone the more you label and the more you separate people, the harder it is for, for all sorts of people to access things. So it's really important to just think a little bit more wider about all of these things. Yeah. Fab. Brilliant. Thank you. OK. So is there anything you can say there about sort of like the business case and the ethical case with those sorts of things with overcoming barriers to participation? I mean, I think um, the business case is, is an interesting one, isn't it? Because often um, when, again, I'm working with organisations and, and venues, yes, there is a social and moral duty to open things out so that we are more equitable in our offer. But actually, you know, coming down to the bottom a kind of uh, nuts and bolts of it, it can be bums on seats, it can be people buying tickets to come into your spaces. The more opening and welcoming and encouraging you are to people to come in, the more people that will actually interact and engage with your, your workshops, with your, um, your shows, whatever your offer is. So I think whilst, yes, there is a social and moral importance to this, there is also a strong business case. And I think exactly what Zoe said about... Um, you know, all our environment should be as welcoming as possible from the moment people interact with you at the beginning. So that could be, you know, buying a ticket or booking onto a workshop or stepping foot into your space or into your um, venue. That if you're thinking about that experience, a better experience for everyone, then you're going to get repeat customers. You're going to get people coming back, connecting with you. Um, and I think if you kind of look at it less in just you know one lens of as Zoe said we're only doing it for this group of people and 
more as we're going to do this it makes it a better experience for all of these people um you know you're you're setting up an environment that people are going to want to come to and i think you know kind of going back to what i was saying about you the experience starts from the moment people engage with you initially i think things like having a clear point on your website that is linked to access that perhaps has you know that's clear not buried under like you know 500 different links it's top you know front and center that people can click on and within access you know depending on what your offer is to people that there are um videos or photographs um or social stories you know where people can actually see what's going to happen when they come to your space um if you're kind of limited for resources even just somebody with a, a phone camera walking through the space you know this is the distance from the car park into the space this is what it's like when you get in there this is what you can expect this is where you need to do this so that people can kind of see that you know what the space is like beforehand that can really help people who have physical access needs but also those that perhaps um, have sensory needs and might need to be able to visualize where they're going ahead of going um mm. so i think all of those things and just being really clear about what your space is so describe it as much as possible and with the offer you know if it isn't a physical space if it is a workshop use as many descriptors as you can so that you can encourage people to understand what your space is like um and if you're doing all those things already where can you amplify that where can you share it where are the groups of people that you want to connect to you know is it through the specialist school system is it through um particular groups of people that are meeting already so that you know you can really utilize that to have more people come to your space which you know if you're particularly if you're a revenue generating organization is really really important um and i think can be a very very clear business case to make yeah, I think I think as well, just just to add to that as well, Hannah, I think one of the things to be really clear about, and this will help you with your planning and your uh, discussions with people, um, particularly with disabled people, is if you go back to the social model of disability and the medical model, when you're planning an event, if you ask disabled people and include those disabled people, ask them what their access requirements are and try and keep that sort of language going rather than asking them what their um, what their disability is or what their impairment is. Because if you know what their access requirements are, you can resolve the barrier and put a solution in place. And it's, you know, very simply, you know, if I ring the theatre and I'm going to see a performance, um, you know, I either need to sit close to the front because I'm visually impaired or I need to have audio description of the um, of the event of, of whatever I'm going to see. Um, if somebody says to me, you know, what, what's my visual impairment? And I say to them, oh, well, I have diabetic retinopathy and cataracts. They still cannot make an informed decision about how they're going to put a solution in place. So if you can start to switch to that type of language and to start with, some disabled people will be using um, impairment language as well. So it's just a gentle process of beginning to get people to be a bit more direct about what is the acts you know what's the actual need that they require you to resolve i suppose i think that's a really good point zoe and i think kind of to build on that as well having if you can you've got the capacity within the organization to be able to have an identified person that people can contact if they've got any questions about access and even if you're a smaller organization you can't facilitate that just to have something on your your website or your booking page that says you know we welcome conversations about your access needs so that you're meeting people um, and that they can see that you know that attitude I think out of all of these barriers for me personally getting your attitude right can actually overcome quite a lot of the other things and you may learn from that I think you can have all these other things if your attitude or the attitude of the organization is wrong it doesn't matter if you have all the other things in place it's you know it's always going to be a not positive experience for the person um coming to the space yeah and I think you know we uh, myself and Hannah you know we, we live in Shropshire we've existed here for a long time we go to lots of events we know that you know that there are medieval towns there are other things going on um, you know, disabled people weren't necessarily considered in the past in the same way. Um, I think attitude is the key, because even if some venue is not fully accessible to me, if you're welcoming and you explain the situation and you say we are working towards this, I'm much more you know, excited by being within that organisation and going to that event. 
Um, I'm not going to pick every single organisation up every time I walk through the door if something's not in place. Um, because if they're welcoming and with those attitude issues in place, I'm going to be much more, you know, meet people halfway, I think, is is what I'm trying to say. And I think is what all disabled people think. Absolutely. And I think the the reverse of that as well is, is don't say that you have things that you don't have. So, you know, um, some places so we've got a quiet space but when you turn up it's either up like you know three flights of stairs or it isn't really a quiet space because it's like in the back of somewhere that's really noisy so if, if you haven't got those things don't say you have you know again it's kind of comes back to the attitude and expectation I think that as long as you're kind of being reasonable and open with people you're going to get a much better response than um you know if you're kind of saying you're accessible when you're not I mean the amount of venues that I've phoned and said like you know are you oh yeah 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 we're accessible and you turn up and they've got three steps to go inside in terms of the physical access um so it's just making sure that what you say is actually the case. And, and that is why actually photographing and um, videos can be really beneficial to people before they come to your space, because then you can see for yourself, you know. And if there are kind of small adjustments that you can make, I mean, Zoe talked in the beginning about chairs. I know like for some of our rural audiences, one of the things I've encouraged in some of the spaces is for them just to buy four or five chairs with arms so that, you know, they probably can't afford to buy 100 chairs that have solid backs and arms but a few that can be reserved and it's not you know it's not ideal it's not perfect but it's a good step in the right direction in terms of being able to say to people you know if you require this and I think you know this probably links into the business case as well particularly where we have an aging or partly aging population in parts of the county is that you know disability is something people acquire and actually the statistics show us that as people age they're more likely to acquire disability than not and I think sometimes again with the other ring we can think disability is something that happens to this group of people but actually it might be happening to the people that are currently connecting with your organization so to keep them connecting to you you need to evolve and think about what their needs might be as they age as well as those that obviously have um disabilities and, and are younger or were born with it or acquired it when they were younger i think part of the business case needs to include that as well in terms of what that might mean as people age I think and I think that's really important about that point about having the correct attitude and that being the most important thing because I think a lot of the thing people might be listening to this going feeling quite overwhelmed that there's quite a lot to be done in order to improve accessibility to their space and things like that and people are often afraid to do the wrong thing and be seen to do the wrong thing because they don't know what don't know what they have to do or they and they don't want to be seen to be offensive if they do do the wrong thing what do you think about that I think um, I think the thing is to to start somewhere, not to keep putting it off. I think that's the first step. Um, and then the next step is there's an awful lot of information out there that you can use and utilize um, and, and copy that other people are doing. And I think the other thing is to you know maybe to have um, you know an action plan of how you can start to move things forward so that it doesn't become this onerous task or it doesn't become too much at once. I think if you're very realistic and it's using smart objectives, isn't it? You know, it's making sure that we're thinking about, you know, all of the way that the way that you might plan the situation. So it might be that you have a three, five, 10 year plan about the changes that you're making and think about, you know, um, this week, what can you change? <laughs> you know, this year, what can you change? What could you change in two years? I think the thing is to keep it manageable um and, and and to start having those conversations with other people that have changed things you know I think you know we we do it for climate change things there's a there's a whole policy called the green doors policy in Birmingham where you know just sort of you know average folk I suppose um implement different sustainable things into their housing and then other people go and visit and ask questions and talk to them about it you know I think we we need to do that across all of the um barriers to access in the arts in Shropshire you know let's talk to each other let's engage more let's think about what is possible you know and it, it may be that you know if five organizations work together you could actually look at some access solutions together you don't have to do everything on your own and I think it's if you work as a silo or just there on your own it's very very hard to get some of these systems in place but I think if you work with other people 
uh, in a more open way, then it'll be easier to change things. Fab, brilliant. Yeah, and you mentioned um, welcoming spaces a bit earlier on. I can't remember if it was Hannah or Zoe that said it, sorry. Do you want to just expand on what you mean by welcoming space and how venues can be more welcoming and organisations, of course? I, mean, I think that could be almost a million dollar question, Alice, because it's, you know, <laughs> no longer it's a piece of string. Who are you looking to welcome? Um, and what is your space? What is your capacity? What's the resource? But I think, you know, some of the things that we've talked about so far, I think the top part of the list would be attitude, you know, making sure that all of your staff, uh, no matter where they work, if they're um, decision makers, if they're on the ground, one of the things that um, I talked to one of the culture, leisure and tourism venues about that had a lot of uh, customer facing. Uh, roles and then decision makers that didn't necessarily connect together is that if you've got people that are directly meeting the public that you make sure there's a mechanism that any um challenges or positives as well that come up around access and people's access to the spaces is fed up to the decision decision makers so that could be a book or an excel spreadsheet where things are noted down because often people that are on the ground and hearing those things then not always and sometimes they are obviously within small organizations the decision makers so it means then you get a misset between the people that are directly connecting to the people that you're working with and those that actually might be able to influence the change and the decision and so having it as part of um, the infrastructure, I guess, you know, and if you have regular team meetings or you have a committee or trustee meetings, whatever the structure of your, your organisation is, that access is always on that agenda. And it's not something you just do on high days and holidays. It's a constant iterative conversation of what are we doing? What else could we do? And it doesn't have to be. And I, and I do understand absolutely what you say, Alice, about it can feel overwhelming and people don't want to do the wrong thing. They don't want to. Um, perhaps make choices um, that are, are, you know, are, are not positive for their organisation. But I think that's why it's important to have conversations, you know, with local people, look at what national bodies are doing as well in terms of charities, particularly in terms of language and the language that you use when you're talking about groups of people. Um, language is obviously, a, a, you know, a huge kind of um, a huge thing shall we say in that not everybody agrees on the type of language that is used but actually there are language and words that should not be used so you know just being clear about why you're using that language and having the confidence in that and if somebody individually doesn't identify with that language that's fine you know never going to please everybody but that as an organization you have the confidence to know why you use certain terminologies or you refer to people in a certain way because it has been endorsed almost by by um, a national body or a group that you're working with. And I think having yeah, everybody in your organisation, no matter where they are working, as part of that change is one of the biggest things you can do to be welcoming so that people understand where people might be coming from as well in terms of their day. I think there's something interesting as well in terms of attitude that, you know, often kind of people with disabilities and people that are perhaps um, underserved, underrepresented as well are constantly having to battle through other people's opinions, thoughts, comments. So if you can be as neutral and as welcoming as possible. So if someone comes into your space, you know, being aware of your body language, not having a side bob to your head when you're talking to somebody, um, you know, being just as neutral as you can. And if you are saying to somebody, you know, do you need any help? just literally say it like that do you need any help you know it has no kind of connotation or tone or um expectation and I think some of it is as well and it sounds a bit glib but it's just about being like nice people when people come in like you know you're there invite people in like be like smile say hello like you know disabled people are just people so you know say hello say good morning anything I could do to help you. If there are particular things you think you could point people in the direction of that might be useful, you know, is it useful to show you where or tell you where? And just be as neutral as possible in that, I think is really important. Um, and then I think some of the welcoming as well, like we talked about, is things that happen before you get to that space. Um, and also, like I said about representation, like, you know, can you see yourself reflected on that company's website, in the materials that they use, um, you know, so that you can see that it's a place for you. I think that is is important too. 
Um, Zoe, I don't know if you've got anything to add on welcoming spaces. Yeah, I think, you know, disabled people are very smart. Um, they can also, you know, people use technology now to overcome some barriers to participation and to accessing things. Um, but you still need to think about as organisations how you can um, adjust things and be welcoming. So, if you know, if disabled people are present and in the room, I'm very excited to think, you know, that's great. This organisation is obviously working more positively towards more people accessing their their services. Um, so I'm likely to go back. And I think these, you know, it's really important to think about that message that you're giving out by who's not in the room, I'd say, you know, look at that and see, you know, quite quickly you can begin to identify your gaps in provision, really, um, and how you might start to change that. Go and visit venues where people are openly, um, you know, accessing them and welcoming everybody. See how they do it. Ask them, you know, there's, the, the people will get engaged with you and have those conversations. So I think it's really important to start thinking about that and to think about, you know, we don't all have to know how to do everything every time you do something. But I know um, lots of visually impaired people I know may go to, uh, you know, a cafe, a restaurant, to an exhibition you know it might just be like a little photography exhibition and they'll arrive there may well be somebody on reception who's been there for several hours and quite bored what you might do is just say you know like, can I offer any help um, how can I welcome you to the exhibition today they may say to you oh is it an audio described exhibition and then you may say go into a complete panic and thinking no it's not but the thing is, you can probably describe those images to that person, but just do it in a very chatty, welcoming style. Um, and, you know, and blind people, really, if, if you start to have that engagement, they can ask you questions. So it's much easier to, you know, rather than being scared of doing it, you know, do it. Just have a go and get involved, I think. And actually, I think we are good at that in Shropshire anyway. I think we're very welcoming. But I think it's just taking it to that slightly higher plane to carry it on, really, with everybody. Brilliant. I think that's really good to hear that Shropshire's doing OK. <laughs> um, we're coming up to five. Well, we're on five o'clock. So should we have a short break where people can make a cup of tea if they want to have a loo break or things like that and just pause for 10 minutes and then come back? Is that all right? Does that sound yeah. good? Yep. OK, yeah. fab. We shall do have a 10 minute break. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Just to remind you and anybody else who, who's with us this evening, we have got a deadline for the first round of funding. So if anyone is interested in securing between one to five thousand pounds, if they go on to the Vibrant Shropshire Shropshire Co uh, Cultural Compact pages on the Shropshire Council website, they can see details of the priorities and the criteria to apply for that funding. The first round will end on the 11th of December, and then there's an opportunity again in 2024, March, to apply for the second round. Yeah, okay. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. Fab, should we carry on and continue now? We've, uh, our 10 minutes are up. Um, so we've talked a lot about overcoming bias participation, specifically around disability access, and we have sort of touched on the other kinds of accessibility that there are already. But do we want to just talk a little bit more about that sort of talk about economic accessibility, transport, communication, that sort of thing? But perhaps talk a little bit about Shropshire's situation and with accessibility. Well, it's a big issue of getting people out in the evenings, isn't it? And moving people around between the villages. Yeah. In the, uh, even the evenings. Um, and though we have a train a service, uh, it's, um, yeah, it's a problem. A regular bus service does not exist in the evenings. No, it doesn't. And I'm in Market Drayton where there's a bus every two hours and that only goes to Shrewsbury and to Newcastle, but you can't get to Whitchurch or or Wem or anything like that. So it is a it's a real lack of funding on transport side of things, definitely. And I think I think, you know, one of those issues is um that we have to I mean, you know, we do have touring theatre companies, don't we? We do have organizations that will tour around the region that's still really important I think while we have transport issues and other things going on you know there, there's also um thinking about other ways that we can um I mean I mean you know I'm in very south Shropshire right on the borders of Clibri Mortimer 
Um, you know, even getting to Ludlow is incredibly difficult, um, yeah. let alone getting to Shrewsbury. Um, so I think it's about, you know, I suppose through things like, you know, the doctors and other systems, there are car, car sharing schemes, you know, but maybe we should be looking at this in culture and looking at other ways of getting to events. Um, you know, how could we sort of work together a little bit more on some of these issues? Um, I think one of the other things I'd mentioned it before um, is about digital accessibility. So even though I might not be able to get somewhere and, you know, there's loads and loads of talks on at the National Gallery that I would love to access. But again, you know, that's London based. It's such, you know, such a huge distance. Um, but I can go online, listen to some of their talks and some of their events um, and access information. Which just reminds me, there's a really good book, and I don't know if you can put that in the chat page, Alice, or something. Um, there's a book called Against Technoableism by Ashley Shu, and it says it's about rethinking who needs improvement. And I think it, it's a really interesting read. It's it's not that long, um, but actually it's applicable across everything, really. Um, that book about techno-ableism. So I think, uh, you know, things like that would really help us all focus in on uh, how to how to change things and how to think about things. I think that's a really interesting point, Zoe. And I think um, the pandemic kind of changed the game a little bit, didn't it? In terms of it, all of a sudden things were available online that previously had not been accessible. Um, you know, so actually something where people were absolutely driven to make those decisions, all of a sudden things were available, which is quite interesting, isn't it? You know, when the whole culture shifts, what becomes available, which means that it could have been available previously. Um, I mean, I think even kind of of the use of, of Zoom and Teams and other there's other video branded um, calling uh, devices out there um, but that that has had you know a huge impact like for me personally I know that that's made a big impact in terms of what I'm able to do physically for work because actually prior to the pandemic pretty much every meeting that was had bar the odd one on the telephone people were expected to be there in person and whilst obviously you know it's still it's not a replacement in terms of perhaps relationships and when you want to do some work that's more connected but particularly where it's just about exchange of information I think the pandemic has really changed digital access and the availability of that However, I think there are some organisations that then just removed that when the pandemic stopped because they had people back in their spaces. But actually, there's lots of people, as Zoe said, that would really benefit from that still having a duality. Um, and even small things like there's times where I haven't been able to physically get to events or, you know, travel for meetings and you can't they say oh we're having it on zoom as well it's a hybrid meeting but you can't hear anything anyone's saying and it's not expensive to buy a good microphone these days like the technology is so much cheaper than it used to be and just that little you know 30 pounds investment in a microphone that means that when you're on zoom or you know the omnidirectional cameras that mean you can be in the space the tech has kind of come a long way comparatively to what it used to cost. And I, I'm aware that, you know, for some smaller organisations, that still might be an investment. But actually, you know, to say that you're having a hybrid meeting and then not be able to hear anything anyone's saying isn't ideal at all. Um, and I think, like I said, the pandemic showed what you can achieve when you actually want to and you're driven to. And a lot of these cultural organisations had to diversify and differentiate their offer because otherwise they wouldn't have been able to carry on having their funding because there would have been no offer and I think it's just quite interesting what can happen when you know they're pushed to the sharp end um, and that meant that that always could have happened but it only happened because they were forced into doing it and I think we if we can keep that ethos of why that worked and how we did it um, I think you're opening up opportunities to you know lots of people um, not just those with disability and access needs yeah and I think what, one of those things about economic issues and affordability, you know, it's really important, isn't it, for all sorts of people. And I think, you know, as an organisation, like, you know, you could put in for the funding that Paul's just mentioned as one way of, of opening up your offer to more audiences that can't afford to go. Um, but also just to think about, you know, that you may offer some free tickets to some people and think about how you would do that and how do you make sure that people that can't access 
culture are accessing it because I think these things are really important. I know when I used to put events on, um, this was years ago, going back probably 30 years ago, you know, certain people wouldn't be able to come to that event uh, and it's because they couldn't afford the taxi there. So we used to fund the taxis there. So I think it's you do have to sort of, I know everyone's going to sort of panic and think huge costs, but I think you've got to think some way of making sure that you can um, diversify who comes to your events and how those people get there. Otherwise, you're always going to get the same people. Um, and I, I think it's a shame, you know, we want to be open to everyone. Um, we want to think about how we can have, you know, different conversations and different opinions to each thing that we're accessing. Um, so I think it's just you just have to think quite widely, don't you, about how you do it. And I think we are very creative in Shropshire. I think we do it. But it's just, you know, learning from each other that there might be an easier way to do it or somebody knows something that you don't yeah. know. And I think sharing that offer as well, Zoe, like if you are running something and you know that a particular group of people have really enjoyed it or benefited from it and you know somebody else is running something similar, that you you share that and, you know, we share kind of what the offer is. Because I think there's lots of amazing things happening in Shropshire, but sometimes they happen like in very small pockets and you can only find them if you dig for them. Whereas, you know, we can as a collective share that amongst each other and you know that cultural offer can be expanded because you can say well oh if you came here and you enjoyed this you might also enjoy this you know we've been working together or they do something similar to us and I think the other thing is obviously there are perhaps wider infrastructural things that can be done to en enable people to travel to spaces but also what are the options about taking work to where people are um one of the things that I've done with Arts Alive and the uh, live theatre programming is worked with the holiday and food um scheme in Shropshire which is um for children and young people who are eligible for free school meals through um, Shropshire Council and they uh, run activities over the holidays um, that are available to those children and they can pay, take part in an activity and then um, are able to have food as part of their day. So I've been programming theatre into those spaces and uh, dance pieces. That means that for some of those young people that will be the very first time they have ever experienced live theatre performance and also you know I'm I might have been able to put that on in a community centre near to where they lived but actually for some people the barrier is that they don't see culture as a thing for them so actually even if the bar like the barrier was removed in terms of cost um their family may not have bought them and they may not have seen it as a space for them so giving people the opportunity to experience culture I think particularly young people it's really important in terms of kind of cultural capital cultural currency that young people are given that opportunity to experience different types of arts and culture and it might be you know that they see it and they go do you know what it's not for me don't like it and that is absolutely fine but actually if you haven't been given the opportunity to see it and particularly unfortunately I think where we are currently in terms of our, our education system there isn't as much access in the state system to arts and culture as there perhaps has been or could be um, so you know what are the options what are the things we can do to take work to where the groups of people we want to work with are and that may then be a step for them to feel that they can actually travel or see it as a space for them um, but that you know there's as Zoe said there's lots of different ways we can do it and almost like the picture at the beginning of the you know the curtain in the forest is what are the other options it doesn't have to be just one way of doing it you know what are the other kind of branches off or different things that you can do um that mean that you can connect with your audience in or you know or your participants in different ways Yeah, I was smiling when you were talking about perceived barriers and people not thinking venues are for them. My background is in libraries. So um, and my, my time there, it was all about making people realise that libraries are spaces for them. So people think of them as quite academic spaces. They think that it's not for them if they don't read books or things like that. It's that sort of perception that it's a very highbrow venue, things like that. But actually changing that perception and putting on fun children's parties and workshops for kids and things like that and making them into community spaces having tea and coffee mornings things like that was really valuable in changing people's ideas about what how they could use their space and how they could use their library 
And I think so. the re- I think the the reverse of that is true as well. At least that is completely true. But also we have been our sensory um, theatre program with Ignition that we've been running with Theatre Seven is that that is a recognised cultural space. And actually yeah. we've had lots of our feedback from families who have been coming to those sessions in how much they've actually enjoyed the activity taking place in a recognised space, and yeah. that they are being recognised in the programming of that space. Um, um, so I think both of those things, you know, can be they're, they're opposites, but can can be true at the same time. Yeah, because... absolutely. It's utilising the assets we have, isn't it? You know, what have we got locally? How do people want to use them? Um, and making sure that we can do that in a way that connects to as many people as possible, I guess. I think as well, what's um, just just from what you're saying and talking, I think just reminds me of um, th- this issue of value, where the value lies. And I think when I'm, I do a lot of um, training in audio description skills within museums and galleries on, and on also on architecture courses for architecture students to think about how they might design spaces from a non-visual perspective, not just a visual perspective, which, you know, we, we think in it, we're sort of like, oh, <laughs> is that how we've been working when actually buildings should be about how bodies move through the spaces, not just the visual appearance. Um, but one of the things is when I train like um, museum and gallery staff and educators and curators and front of house staff, one of the things that becomes quite apparent during that process is that it isn't about, about blind people. It's about individually learning to communicate more effectively, to learn to use descriptive language more effectively, improving your literacy skills, improving your observation skills, and even curators begin to you know, we'll get them to analyse and think about describing a painting to us or an artwork or an artefact or the space or the room or the front entrance. Um, And then they'll say, oh, my God, I never really noticed that. I've been walking past that particular painting for 10 years and I really didn't look at it properly. I've never. And even though the person's had sight, they actually haven't been using it as effectively as a blind person or a partially blind person might be. So I think those things are really interesting when we're we're always perceiving that we're doing these things for a blind person when in actual fact we're not necessarily doing it for a blind person we're doing it to improve our own lives and enrich our own futures and expectations and values so I think it's it's really important really when you're doing stuff to think about that. Brilliant I think that's great thank you very much. Um, so I, we may have covered points of this already, but let's talk a little bit about the work that you guys do and the sort of the key questions that you're asking yourself and the organisations you work with when you're com- thinking about accessibility and things like that. That might be a tricky question. <laughs> do you I have some sort of key points that you're always thinking about? Yeah, I, I think, well, I think you, you know, you do, you break it down, don't you? So, uh I won't say who they are, but, um, you know, during COVID, I was asked to look at um, uh, writing organisations to look at their website to help them with accessibility to their website. And it, to me, as a disabled person and because I do what I do, um, immediately I just thought I started to look through the website and I thought, well, I can feed back to them about what isn't accessible on their website and how to maybe use language in a different way and how to have the welcoming statement for Um, for accessibility issues Um, but what became really obvious to me is that none of the tutors of any of the courses uh, were disabled people delivering those courses there was no images of other types of people on any part of the website Um, there was no sort of discussion around how programming uh, their events or their talks might be for other people and I think you know I did go back to them and said you know I'm very happy to look at accessibility your website so thinking about alt text you know thinking about uh, layout thinking about color and contrast thinking about font size thinking about how somebody that's blind a screen reader would read that website um, looking at all those functional issues I suppose in a way Um, But I said, but it's very, very obvious that you're not actually engaging with disabled people at all just by me looking at your website. And I think sometimes people don't don't realise that disabled people can spot these things very, very quickly. Um, So, it's you know, it's 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 a step process. You know, you think about if I'm putting an event on, um, how accessible is my venue? Is my marketing accessible? Is the programming accessible? 
Is the bar accessible? You know, very often you get tables that are quite high up that you have to stand at to put your drink on. That actually doesn't work for all sorts of people and it excludes people. So I think it's beginning to think about things in a slightly different way. Lighting throughout a building and in a space. How good is it? Is it easy to use that space and to be able to spot things? Um, so acoustically, what is that space like? And acoustics impact on everyone, not just disabled people. So I think, you know, if you can think about the acoustics in a space and try and make, you know, in the past, we used to have a lot of soft furnishings that used to help soak up sounds. Um, a lot of those have been stripped out because particularly in buses, let's say, they're stripped out to make it, you know, fireproof or vandal proof. Um, I mean, but the issue is then as an older person or a disabled person traveling on that transport or traveling in that environment, it's very tinny. Acoustically, it's very unpleasant. And particularly if you're going, you know, across Shropshire in, in something like that, it's not a nice experience. It's not a nice. So you're not going to go out. You're not going to use the public transport in the same way. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's so many little things that you can start to look at um your your you know the menus or the programs or the marketing literature how accessible is it you know have you got large print copies available have you got digital copies available um you know there's different have you done a sort of podcast about the event have you done an audio file you know we can all learn to do these things now because the technology is there and available but it's just being a little bit more flexible i think when you start to think about how you get these messages out to people yeah, and I suppose that comes um, back to your talking about different types of barriers, Hannah, that, that we were talking about earlier, so the attitudinal barriers, the environmental barriers and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's kind of, you know, just keeping those conversations within your organisation, isn't it? And also identifying, you know, why, like, why is it you're looking to work with this particular cohort or bring this particular group or have more representation of this group? And I think, you know, like um, Zoe said at the beginning, um, making sure that we're actually consulting, you know, things like Smart Survey, Survey Monkey are relatively cheap these days to be able to do digital surveys, consultation to ask the questions, you know, if you don't know the answers, ask the questions to people and if you're still kind of finding out then share that with people and say you know we're, we're consulting we want to know more about this we want to know more who about who isn't coming I don't think you have to always be perceived to have the answers and I don't like all of the answers I think you know we're all always learning because things change they progress things come in environmentally you know things like the cost of living crisis obviously the pandemic that actually shift the parameters for lots of people and I think one of the other things to remember as well that is that a lot of like the people do not exist and we've used the word silos a lot but you know there are people with disabilities who are also parents um who also may have children with disabilities themselves um they may be from lower socioeconomic backgrounds they may have other you know factors within their lives so it's kind of like you're not just picking off one aspect of of people um which is why i think kind of if you come back to that idea of making your space as welcoming as possible and I think that, you know, it is a little bit, like I said at the beginning, a million dollar question. But I think, you, you know, in your space when you come in, like, what does it need to do? You know your space best. And if you're not sure, you know the people that are coming to your space or you want to come to your space and take that opportunity to ask those questions of people, you know, ask that question. When you came in today, you know, did you feel welcome? Did you feel like this is a place for you? Um, give people an opportunity to uh, feedback, write things down, you know, say what their experience was like and as Zoe said at the beginning don't don't be offended by the answers to that and also if they say you're doing really well we, we love it fantastic but you know how can you carry on doing that how can you amplify um what you're doing and get other people to be able to be in that space and um or take part in your workshop or you know connect within your your community um so I think yeah constantly asking questions and and being curious as well, I think, is really important. And I think particularly when, you know, it's small organisations and busy organisations, being curious is really, really difficult because, you know, you're kind of doing the work, you're in it, you're doing it, you've got kind of stretched resources, you've got limited time. And so you don't get time to actually look out and look up. And I think kind of those that are perhaps in a leadership role or those that are able to make that time to be able to support those that are in the organisation or working 
working alongside you to build in opportunities to be curious. So whether that's, you know, half a day every so often to come together and, and talk about these things, you know, reflect, discuss, whether that's, you know, just having, like I said, access in the agendas. Um, so you're regularly talking about it, but like wanting to learn more. And I think social media, um, has many downfalls but one of the good things about it is there's lots of uh, people sharing their stories on social media so you know you can utilize Facebook, TikTok, Instagram to find out what it's like for people day to day and actually particularly when you're not getting audiences or participants connecting to you so you know you're only kind of communicating or asking questions of those that are already um, seeing it as a place for them looking at those listening seeing reading that is a really good kind of upside to social media um and obviously with the caveat that you know you've met one person with a particular need you've met one person however it does mean that you can start to understand a little bit more about the day-to-day -day lives or challenges that other people may face in in accessing your space hmm I put a, uh, hello, I'll put a question up because I, I'm interested in this participation of young people in the Strettons. Um, in the, the, um, there's such a lot of creativity about in people and in community, which never gets celebrated, never gets a, a space, never gets a stage. And um, I'm interested in finding out how to get into that. I'm, I'm, I'm too old for this, but I know that there are others who are. Or, or a right age for it, but um, we have a a body which is going to encourage this in the Stratton. It's going to build a project um, with young people. There are not that many young people in the Stratton. They're mostly my age, but that's um, but we have we have some. So how do you how, how where would you begin? I think if I if I would. Um... In any situation like that, I would begin. I, I would identify. A, it depends what sort of creativity you want them to get involved in. But I would I'd identify an artist um, that does it all the time. That's really good at drawing those people together and and then creating uh, art with them, so that they're celebrating it together. And that one of the things is about if you're doing it with those young people, they're more likely to go to the final event or the final showing or the final workshop. And their families will as well. So I think it's then you don't really have to do any marketing because they're already coming. So I think to me, it's finding, you know, there are some there are artists out there that are absolutely brilliant at this. And there's a really fantastic organization called the Caravan Gallery. And I bring them to places where I'm finding it difficult to to draw those communities out. Um, have a look at the website of the Caravan Gallery, because it's just phenomenal the way that they they develop projects and get people to come out of the woodwork and get involved. It's really, really good. Yeah, I will. I think um, what I do is probably look initially at where young people are frequenting um, locally. So whether that's schools or youth clubs, if they still exist in the area. But also looking at, I know in Stretton and the Strettons, you've got lots of organisations that are working with young people. So bringing them yeah. together, you know, and kind of looking at having that connectivity and, and working as a collective rather than perhaps as individuals. Um, and I think sometimes if young people haven't had the opportunity to experience different types of arts and culture, providing almost like a, a menu, a taster to be able to try mm. out different um, activities and art forms so that when you're um, developing more long term offers, you know that there's an interest and an appetite um, for that particular activity because it's been driven by those young people um and i think you know making sure that the voice of the young people when you're making those decisions is is part of that whether that's a youth you know ambassador or um you know like i said utilizing a survey system but that it's not people that aren't those people making decisions with the caveat that actually sometimes people don't know what's available if you're not showing it to them. So I think, you know, having a, a taster day or a taster option of different things can be really good um, to be able to showcase what what you mean when you talk about a particular art form. No, we, we, do well. that. we do that. We do that. We do that. And we started a stretch fest as, a, as a, an open air event 
um, which we're now going this year to combine it with the, the fun day, which gets a lot of a lot of people out. And we do put down a lot of arts um, uh, activities into it so that they can do that. And we see that as a as one part of this participation uh, project. So um, that's that's yeah. I think it's you're right. It's it's it, and getting getting um, young people themselves um, taking a lead. Yeah, you know we've got a fantastic band which we must give a lot a lot more recognition to in the town. We have a great arts festival in the Stretons, which is great, and I like it. And everybody, not everybody is on. It, it's not everybody's cup of tea. It, it can't be. I mean, of course, it, it's mostly um, classical and so on. But um, it's uh, it, it, it it has fifty years' experience of doing that. But it is changing, um, and young people have got their own experiences, and we need to let them. Um, uh, express that publicly. I think if I just give you an example, there's, um, I mean, this is in Wrexham, so it's sort of more, a lot more north. <laughs> um, but there's a young person that I work with there as a filmmaker, and he did a an art project, you know, in a shop unit. Um, and he put his, you know, his marketing went out, developed a little TikTok film that went out. 4,000 people came to that shop unit to see his work. And I think it's because young people are, you know, they're clued into different sorts of marketing than I would look at. So I think it's also thinking about who locally would help, you know, create those things and then market it to those people, I suppose. Yeah. And I think, again, it's about that representation of seeing yourself there, isn't it, in those spaces and seeing it as yes. a place for you. Um Ignition has done some work with young um, disabled presenters going to different activities and showcasing it, sharing it, saying what, you know, is happening in that activity as part of the Actio programme. And I think, you know, again, you know, having it from young people to young people um, is, is really important and I think gives a different dynamic than if it's perhaps adults saying what should happen. Yeah. Absolutely. And Paul's oh, just yeah, made absolutely. a really good point in the chat as well, that sometimes parents and carers um, have the perception that culture is not for their family. And it's the young people who've experienced culture in school that helps them to over helps the parents to overcome that attitude that it's not for them. So they can be a really nice sort of stepping point. But actually introducing children to culture in schools is a really nice stepping point for them getting parents and carers involved and interested. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, um, I, I have to go now, uh, make some tea. But um, yeah, thank you for for the the, the evening. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Noel. Thank, thank you, you for coming thank along. You. Yeah, thank you. So, do we? We're sort of nearing towards the end. We've got twenty minutes until we're finishing. So, if we just sort of think about wrapping up. Do you want to talk a bit about sort of inclusion frameworks and accessibility guidelines and things like that and sort of how organisations can, what steps they need to take to write those and put those in place? I think it might cover some of the bits we've covered already, but. I'm, I mean, I, you know, obviously I've, I've shared a framework in terms of perhaps decision making about what you might do. I think Zoe talked about earlier about having smart outcomes, making sure that they are achievable, um, measurable. Um, I think often there are outcomes that link into our funding that we might have to fulfil, but it's kind of like how can we enhance those and make sure that we're doing it for just beyond those purposes, that it isn't just to say that, you know, we've got this policy or we're doing these things. I think um, having, like I said, opportunities that are built into your calendar to be curious and to also be able to perhaps connect with other organisations, to share practice, ask questions, find out, you know, what you don't know. Um, and also having points in your calendar where you are going to consult with your audience or your participants to find out, you know, what the gaps are. 
I think there's there's lots of ways to do it, but the biggest thing is to make sure that you are actually having practical ways that you're going to achieve things and that you're explaining that as well to your, your audiences, your participants. Um, and if the th there's things that are going to happen five years down the line because you're waiting to raise the money for it, then, you know, say that, have that as part. So people can then join the dialogue rather than it being something that you're kind of, you know, keeping and saying, oh, well, we haven't done that yet, so we can't share it um and i think thinking about your marketing as well in terms of that information you know think about the practical things that you can do like can you go and make sure that your images are more representative you know can you make sure that access is clearly um up front and center on your website mm -hmm. and if you can't move it yet can you you know add something to it that makes it clear you know there's there's those easy wins but I think you have to have a, a, a timeline and a plan to achieve that so it doesn't just become kind of sitting around and talking about it and I think that as an organization can make you feel powerful as well because you can tick off when those things have happened then as well you can say you know we've done this and whilst it might not be the end of it hopefully you'll carry on you know implementing those things you can see what you've achieved and how far you've come um and I think that you know is, is an important part of this is that like congratulating yourselves as well when you've had those successes and your team around you I think is is an important part yeah as much as it can seem as like a box ticking exercise it can be a fun experience to sort of think about these sort of accessibility things and including these different communities can't it Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we are all creative people and utilising that kind of lateral thinking and problem solving. I mean, an example that I had when I worked did some um, training with the, the village halls many years ago and they were saying that people don't come to the hall in the evening because they haven't got a, a light outside and the light was quite expensive they were fundraising to get the light paid for but they hadn't got the money yet so we had a conversation as the whole group about you know what might the solutions be and people came up with the idea of just buying two really strong powered torches and two volunteers being outside in the car park in high vids vests as people arrive and as people leave and it's kind of like you know that for some people that perhaps would find it more difficult to see in a lower level light or where it's dark it's not a perfect solution, but it's a step in the right direction, something that can be achieved quite quickly. So I think sometimes as well, if you've identified problems, you know, is there a short term quick fix that is not perfect, but will do the job? And then you can, you know, longer term implement the things that cost money. Um, but also, yeah, being a, being a bit creative, I guess, in terms of what those problem solving, um, problem solving things might be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, um... Alice, really, it's about, you know, you can map out, you know, uh, we were talking about the five goals that you want to achieve, how you're going to do that, who's responsible for each one of those goals, and for what time scale, um, and also is there a budget attached to those? Because for some of them, there'll be no budget. I mean, it'll be people resources, but as a, as a volunteer board or something, you may be able to make that happen. So I, I really think it's just about you know, writing down, even if it's an A4 sheet of paper or it can be on a matchbox or whatever. I think it's just having it, sharing it and then starting to go through it um, and having proper discussions about each one of those areas that you're looking at. And, and you know, it's like we we're saying, you know, make it achievable, make it realistic. Um, but try and, you know, try and plot them down and begin to think about them and don't think about them as, um the scary things I suppose or yeah. things you can never achieve think about them in steps this is a step process you know how do we work towards them who else can help us what funding is available um and 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 just begin to to work your way through them and then celebrate with everybody when you do work your way through them you know tell people that's what you've done because what some people do is put access provision in place but they forget to tell anyone that they've done it um, and people that have gone sort of don't go because they don't think it's there. So I think it's you've really got to yeah talk about it a lot more, I think. Yeah. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you very much, guys. So is any, I'm going to open up questions to our guests and others. If anyone has any questions now, either you can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and speak or you can unmute yourself and speak. See if we have any questions. We've got just under 15 minutes left. Uh, 
by Vinaloto. Something that might be quite good for people to do, Alice, is perhaps think about a pledge or one thing that they can do from taking away from this session. Because I know sometimes actually people just need a little bit of time to digest what's been said and think about what that might mean for that. Yeah. But I think perhaps if everybody can think about one pledge, something that they've heard um, this evening that could be beneficial to their organisation. And perhaps if anyone is happy to share that now, what their pledge might be. Um, you know what is it you're going to do it doesn't have to be massive it can be something small but is there something you've heard this evening on the call that actually you know you think you can practically take away and achieve within a reasonable time scale um and if you haven't got something yet perhaps think about something in the next three months um you know that is achievable that you could start to implement yeah that's a really good point and also i think we might have mentioned it earlier but people might realize that they are already doing things that are accessible and that's a really that's a really positive thing as well it doesn't have to be starting from scratch it can be realizing that oh actually we are accessible in this way and this way so I think that's really I think that's great I think Tim's put a question in the chat Alice Ooh, let me see okay Tim says he chairs the Amdrams how do we get younger people to join us good question Tim any ideas? What do we think? Well, I, there are. I mean, I could send some stuff after us. I'm sure it's um, the organisation Artichoke, but they might be based up in Durham. Um, they have a whole programme, a way of engaging young people, uh, one onto the board, but two into all their processes. And so, so I'd have a look at how other organisations do it and um, start to talk to them, start to, you know, read through the literature about it. Um, there must be stuff on Arts Council England's website as well about how to do that. But I just think, yeah, just just. I'm sure it's artichoke, but I'll double check. But I mean, have a look, see what they say and how they get those young. It's having young people, isn't it? Um, young people's voices there and young people attracting other young people. That's really the key to it. Um, so you've got to find ways of making that making that possible. And what what's that value to those people being involved in what you're doing, really? And perhaps going to the spaces that they are, you know, in, um, depending on obviously the setup of the group. Um, you know, if you have got somebody that the schools would be happy to have in or, you know, if there is um, a local scout or brownie group um, or a youth group, going in and doing some tasters so that you're actually going to them and showcasing rather than expecting them to come to you, I think can, you know, break down some of those barriers. Um and also maybe thinking about the type of shows you're putting on as well. Like if it's something that, you know, young people are not going to want to be involved in or doesn't represent them in terms of stories, um, you know, thinking about that and having perhaps somebody within your committee or organisation that is younger that can look at, you know, what kind of shows might younger people be interested in coming to see, putting on um, and, you know, making those decisions based around that so that it actually is something they'd want to do. That's a really good point. Yeah, I really like that. Um, Leslie, did you have a question? I think you're on mute now. I think you should be able to turn your mic on if you just click the mic button. Can't hear you at the mo. If I can. Do you want to type your question, Leslie? Is that easier if you can't unmute yourself? Alice, I think that Leslie's got she's got the um strike through on the microphone. I think it's yeah. um I That's don't know if she's she's on mute. I think. But it isn't the strike through like that. It's got the circle and the strike through, ah, which I think okay. so it's not enabled. Oh, she just wanted to let us know she's still here. Hi, Leslie. Thank Hi, you. Leslie. I'm glad you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Siri, as well. Such a valuable webinar. Thank you. Can we make contact with you later, Zoe and Hannah? Yeah, yeah? absolutely. We can share our email. Um, yeah, I can do a bit of a, a, 
an email round afterwards, maybe share some resources. We think about some places that people could go and look at things afterwards as well. I'll share that book link yeah. and things, Zoe. I, and I I'll think, share yeah, your contacts. Bit, there's other things as well I think would be really useful. So I can, yeah, ping those over, Alice, and then we can, yeah. that could be sent to everyone, couldn't it? Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Fantastic. That's great. So I, if that's everything, I think we've sort of covered everything. Is there anything you ladies want to cover else? Hannah and Zoe, do you want to cover anything else? Think I, I think to me it's to just a close? Have, have fun doing it. You know, that's the yeah. important thing. You know, it, it isn't about it being a horrible task to do. It's have fun. Yeah, it could be really exciting. You could find yeah. out so many things about your community and about people that you've not been accessing before absolutely um, that could just be a joyful thing not a not a negative thing yeah and I think as well like you know the reason that arts and culture is so important is that it is joyful it brings happiness it brings that um you know positive experience so yeah to keep that at the center of it when when if if things are harder you know that the outcomes of that of people experiencing that far outweigh you know what might be some of the challenges in putting things together um and I'd also just like to thank everyone for giving up their time to come um it's nice to have so many people on the call yeah absolutely Thank you very much everyone for coming.